When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Turn to chapter 4 then and see where Paul goes from here. Because having established those identities, uh, having been whipped into shape at school with our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, having been disciplined into true discipleship, what does that mean for me? Where do I go from here? I'm starting to, you've, you're weaning me off the law and its legalism. Thank you for that. You're cautioning me against overcorrecting in either direction. You're helping me see the purpose of the law, but also the fact that through Jesus, hopefully the law has served that purpose. And I can come unto Christ and be made and be perfected in him. It's the only way perfection will ever come. So the remainder of Galatians, chapter 4 and chapter 5 and chapter 6, Paul is going to build on the foundation he's already laid. He's going to start by helping us again embrace that true identity as children of the covenant. Children of God, this is who we are. So notice chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. And not just tutors and governors, you could say schoolmasters and disciplinarians and guardians and, and regents, if we're using oh, regal terms. If you're in a kingdom... And let's say that the king is, is nearing death, but the heir is too young to occupy the throne. They can't even lift themselves all the way up there. You're going to need a stepping stool at it, right? Well, what's the king going to do? Well, the king's got to whip the crown prince into shape. Uh, he's going to send tutors and disciplinarians and guardians and schoolmasters and everything else. And if upon the king's death, the child is still not ready to assume the throne, then a regent is put in place. They know I'm not the king, I'm just the regent. I'm supposed to kind of bridge the gap between the old king and the up and coming king because they're not old enough to do it yet. And so I am a, a figurehead, I am leading in, in name only, and I'm trying to honor the wishes of the the king I served, and the king I am now serving. Even though it sometimes looks like that king, that king is serving me. I mean, you ask the prince, and it's like, yeah, old so-and-so keeps calling the shots, even though I'm the one that's supposed to wear the crown. Well, you will. Your head hasn't, well, in some ways your head is already too big for it. But literally, it's not yet big enough to, to, to hold that crown, to occupy that throne. So for the meantime, I'm sorry if it feels like, like you're being told what to do. I'm sorry if I've given you a checklist of all of your responsibilities and I've laid out your schedule and told you all these things that you have to master. Oh, master. You get it? The day will come that you will rule. But since you're not yet ready for it, I guess something has to rule you. And that's the law, according to, to Paul. That's what it was trying to do. I mean, the way he puts it, if you're still a child, have not yet grown up in God, then yeah, it's going to feel like you're a servant, even though you're a son or daughter. You're, you're the heir, but you're, you're not ready for the inheritance. And I'm always fascinated to see those who, who are so angry about the, the strictness of the gospel. And if you're feeling its strictness, well, it probably needed to be strict. Elder, Ma Elder Packer, excuse me, used to say that you can tell when a dog is ready to have the leash taken off, when the leash sags, when it hangs, because that proves that the dog is willing to stay even closer to the master than it has to. 
If the, if the leash is taut, if it's, if it's straight line, then it's being pulled so hard by the dog that if you gave the dog the chance, it would be further away from you than what the leash allows. So again, wait till it starts to droop, and then you'll see, oh, the dog is okay being, staying close to me. Now no, need, no leash is needed. But for those who are struggling, those who feel restricted and get frustrated by how uh, demanding the church is, and I can't do anything I want to do. It's like, oh, then your desires have not yet been disciplined. Your heart hasn't yet been changed. You're, you want to be conformed to the world, which means you have not yet been transformed by Christ. So, yeah, it's going to feel a little restricted for now. It's going to feel like you've got the leash and it's going to hurt your neck because you're the one that keeps pulling against it. You're going to need some boxes to check and a list of, of chores to perform. You're going to, it's going to feel like a servant. But please don't forget you're the son. You're the daughter. The throne is yours once you're ready for it. So verse 3 through 5, building upon the analogy. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. This seems like an echo of what he said earlier about being cursed. And yeah, Christ took the curse and crowned himself with it. So he could come down and know what it feels like for the rest of us cursed individuals. He took the curse so he could break the curse and free us from it all. And here, this is more of the condescension of Christ. He, he's the son of God, but he chose to become a servant since that's what we sons feel like as we're servants under the law. He was born of a woman and how's that for mortal condescension? Babe in a manger? When it was king in heaven? It's amazing to see what Christ was willing to do. And all because God, the Father of mercies, sent him to do that. Okay? Made of a woman. Made under the law. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? I hope we know the answer to that one. Well, verse 6, because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You see the order there? Yeah, it might feel like you're a servant, but live into that servitude, learn the discipline, and before you know it, you'll realize, oh, I was never a servant at all. I was a son or daughter from the very beginning. And if a child, then I get the inheritance. I am an heir of God through Christ. That almost seems too good to be true. Then how do I know that it is true? Well, be still. Look inward. Reach upward. And how do you feel about the title Father in Heaven? Can you feel how accurate that is? Can you feel the reality of your relationship to the point that once we feel the Spirit of the Son in us, it awakens within us the realization that we are all sons and daughters of God. It leaves us whispering, Abba, Papa. An intimate relationship. It's not just Eli. Remember we talked about this in Gethsemane and Calvary. Abba is Papa. Eli is my father. Eli is my God. And if Eli or Eli is the, is the distance, the, the infinite, then Abba is the intimate, so close. And if when we pray, I had a student say this once, I'm grateful for the these and the thous, 
But there are times I just need to use my own language to speak with God. There are times I need to call him Father, but times I need to call him Daddy. I need to be close. And in those times when the Spirit whispers, it's okay to call me that. I am your Father, after all. I am your Papa. Abba. And he responds. It's his favorite title. This is exactly what Paul built on when he wrote his letter to the Romans. Here again you see a preview of what he'll teach to the Roman saints. You remember this verse from Romans chapter 8, verse 15 through 17? Such a beautiful passage. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the servitude side of things. There's bondage. That's, a, that's fearing. But ye have received the spirit of adoption. That's child. Okay, That's son or daughter. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I think that Romans 8 is an even better version, but I'm so moved by what Paul says here to the Galatians because it's the same truth. You're children of God. Dig deep and feel it. You'll know that about yourself. And therefore, you'll know what God is preparing you for. As Paul says it twice in different letters, Eliza R. Snow put it into poetry. And in that beautiful hymn, O My Father, O My Abba, in the second and third verse, listen to her rendition of what Paul has said. Yet oft times a secret something whispered, You're a stranger here. And I felt that I had wandered from a more exalted sphere. Again, there's something inside that tells me that. I had learned to call thee Father through thy spirit from on high. And again, that's how Paul says it exactly to the Galatians and to the Romans. There was something about this spiritual experience, this, this nudge to look upward and see a resemblance in the heavens. I learned that through this, the Spirit. I learned to call thee Father. I couldn't help myself. Abba is what came from the lips. But until the key of knowledge was restored, I knew not why. And thank heaven for that key of knowledge. Paul's been dropping hints for 2,000 years. But thanks for the restoration. That same new and everlasting covenant it reminded us of our truest, deepest identity. And it left us with Abba on our lips. In verse 8 and 9, Paul then says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. It's like, how, how did that work? You didn't know him? The, the, the capital G, true God, so what did you end up doing instead? You went after lowercase g, false gods? It's like the Athenians the, the, to the unknown god and this idol worship. Out of ignorance, I get it, but you didn't know the true God. But now, he says, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, that might be even better, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? That's a, that's a powerful phrase, weak and beggarly elements. Another way to translate that is weak and destitute principles. But that's what you're going back to? You'd rather be back in bondage? You finally ascended the throne and the crown feels too heavy? Like, I can't do this. I don't know if I'm doing it right. Nobody's telling me everything I'm supposed to do anymore. And, and I'm, I'm scared to death I'm going to do this wrong. So can I please go back to school? I need my tutor again. I need somebody rapping me on the knuckles and, and slapping me upside the head. I need somebody pointing out my every mistake. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Why do you want to go back to the tutor? You graduated. Why do you want a schoolmaster when <laughs> you're supposed to be a schoolmaster now yourself? You're supposed to be teaching others. Reigning as a joint heir with Christ and an heir of God. To me, I'm fascinated the way Paul is 
trying to wean people off the old law. That was so hard when, that's all, when that was all they had, but now seems comparatively easy compared to, <laughs> compared to having full freedom to live up to divine expectations. Right? An interesting buyer's remorse here, but beggarly elements, destitute principles that won't get you where you need to go. I, I'll admit, up to this point, you have been sinning in ignorance, or maybe even trying to obey in ignorance, <laughs> but the ignorance has passed. You know God, and you are known of God. So there's no going back. Destroy the ships, Cortez. We're staying in the promised land. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. At least I hope we've gotten to that point. I don't see many oh, young adults, or older adults for that matter, at Thanksgiving dinner begging the hosts, can I sit back at the, the little table again? <laughs> no, we, we graduate from the little table, and it's like, oh, okay, I got to sit at the B table now, finally. I don't see many of us go, wanting to go back to the old things once we've graduated from them. I don't, I don't see many teenagers wanting to drag mom and dad up to the pulpit with them on fast and testimony meeting, saying, whisper my testimony in my ear. <laughs> no. I want to be able to stand on my own two feet. I want to grow up in God. I think that's something within all of us. The same spirit that cries, Abba, Father, recognizing our sonhood and daughterhood also wants to grow up to be more like him. And that's what Paul is getting at. Well, verse 10 through 12, they're still not there. Ye observe days and months and times and years. You're still holding on to the Jewish calendar. Please just let it go. It, it's all right. You're not responsible for that anymore. We have graduated. I am afraid of you, he says. In a better translation, I am afraid for you. I fear for you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Think about that coming from a missionary. Was all my work for nothing? All that work to convert you? All that work to convince you that the law really had been fulfilled in Christ? Was that for, for nothing? Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Now, what I think he's getting at there is... I'm just like you, a Jew by birth. But will you be like me, a Christian by choice? I was raised with the law, and I was more zealous toward it than even you. But now I am zealous toward Jesus. I have been crucified with him, buried with him, risen with him, clothed in him. I'm different, and I want you to be different too. Until you get there, it's not hurting me. That's what he says at the end. You haven't injured me at all, but you're hurting yourself. There's a JST to all of that that teaches similar things. Brethren, I beseech you to be perfect as I am perfect. For I am persuaded as ye have a knowledge of me, ye have not injured me at all by your sayings. It's like if you really know who I am, yeah, nothing you say could hurt my feelings. I, I got thick skin, believe me. But... I, I hope you can grow up a bit and be a little more like me, which means we're both being a little more like Jesus. Okay, to be as perfect, even to be perfect, even as I am perfect. Again, that's not sinless. That's not flawless. It's mature. It's fully developed. It's grown up. I, I'm not, I don't want to go back. I don't want to grow down and be a servant again. I've, I've realized who I am as a son of God, and I am growing up in him. In verse 13, he then says, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first. And what he's reminding them of is, I mean, think back to that first mission of mine. As I came through Galatia, you, you sensed my infirmity. It was obvious. You knew about it. I, I don't know if he was sick. I don't know if he had some kind of physical illness or something that was going on in him, but they knew about it. And yet, you were fine. In fact, I was good enough to at least get, take the chance to preach the gospel to you. Some have wondered, maybe Paul didn't intend to spend much time in Galatia, but he got sick there, and he decided, well, I'm here, I might as well preach the gospel. Okay, so through infirmity of the flesh, 
I preach the gospel to you. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. And what I love about this is, I mean, as a return missionary myself, I can picture Puerto Ricans, the way they treated me, the way they loved me, despite my poor Spanish, despite my culture shock and my inability to teach them anything, this temptation of the flesh, and remember, temptation is better translated trial. So whatever he was going through, they were okay with it. They didn't look down on him. They didn't despise him. Like, man, if you were really a servant of God, wouldn't God kind of get you through this kind of stuff? You, you shouldn't have to suffer. No, they, they treated me like an angel. They treated me like as if Jesus himself was among them. Keep reading. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Oh, that's, that's stark. That's one thing to give you the clothes off your back, but to pluck your eye out and give it to someone who might be in need? Some have even suggested maybe that's a hint at what Paul was going through. Maybe the infirmity of the flesh was something sight-related. Remember the thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times to be removed and we wondered what, what could he be talking about? When we see him blinded on the road to Damascus and Ananias re restoring his sight, well, was it a permanent restoration? Was it a complete restoration? Was it only a symbolic rest? I don't know. But some have wondered over the centuries, did Paul have eye problems? And when he was in Galatia, was it so obvious people were like, whoa, there's an infirmity of the flesh. But this is a servant of God. And we love God and we love him. He's introducing us to Christ. And man, it feels like Christ is right here with us. This is an angel among us. And if his eyes are causing him problems, man, I wish I could give you my own. You have given me spiritual sight. The least I could do is, <laughs> would be to give you physical sight in return. And that's how good they were. That's how converted they were. What happened, guys? Who hath bewitched you? Why are you f sliding back when you had so much momentum moving forward? I have felt that about people I came to love in the mission field who gained testimonies. I knew it. And then slipped back into inactivity. I have felt that with former students and friends who may be struggling in their faith and you just look back to the old days when you were mission companions or when you were youth together or just growing up in the same home with the same faith and testimony. And it's, man, I, you would have done anything for me. Now I'll do anything for you. I just want you to see through my eyes. Can I pluck them out and give them to you? When will you see? Why have you been spiritually blinded? Verse 16 Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I hope you don't feel that way. We were friends before, willing to give one another anything we could, and I still feel that way toward you. I, do you feel that way toward me? Are you perceiving me as an enemy because I'm telling you the truth? And yes, sometimes the truth hurts, pricks the heart. I didn't mean to cut it. He says, they... And by they, he could mean false teachers, false preachers, uh, false apostles, like we saw in Corinth, these super apostles, these, these missionaries that are full of themselves. Is it Judaizers? Just any, whoever the they is, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. Oh, who's affecting whom and in what way? Paul, as a true apostle, I was trying to affect you toward goodness, toward righteousness, toward faith in Christ's grace. These zealous people are trying to affect you toward something else. But how are they leaving you, better or worse? They just want you on their side. Misery loves company, strength in numbers, whatever it is. They're just zealously working toward you. But be, be careful about that kind of zeal. Believe me, I used to have it myself. Now I have a, the right kind of zeal in the right cause. But speaking of zeal, Paul says, 
It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Again, when I was there, physically present. You were ready to physically pull out your eyes and give them to me. You were so zealous for truth. Now there's some other zealots that are trying to get you zealous for falsehood. Be careful. If Zeal is wonderful. As long, I mean, momentum is great. I hope you have the right direction. The Lord saw that in me and picked me up and turned me around. So I'd run in, the, in, the, in his way. And I've been running ever since. It is good to be zealously affected always. It's a great phrase. In section 58 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which I quoted a bunch from already, we see the Lord's final dispensation equivalent of that phrase. To Paul, it was be zealously affected always in a good thing. Section 58, it was to be anxiously engaged in a good cause. There's still a good cause to be engaged in. Let's get, let's be anxiously engaged in it. Not anxious about being engaged. Simply anxiously engaged. Verse 19 and 20 then. And these are beautiful words of love, terms of endearment. He calls them my little children. And again, if you're little, you might still need a schoolmaster. If you're little, you might still have to be treated like a servant sometimes. I'm just trying to prepare you for the throne. So my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. You catch that last phrase? I'm, I'm worried about you. I don't know what's happened since I was there in Galatia last. There seems to be some sliding backwards, and it concerns me. There seems to be some foolishness, some bewitching. Are you under some strange magic spell? Under the Judaizing influence. I'm worried. And so, what am, I, what am I doing for you little children that I love so much? Here I am. His, his analogy is powerful. I travail in birth again. Here's Paul the Apostle taking the part of the mother hen. The maternal imagery, trying to give birth to a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I mean, there's labor for you, uh, together, uh, complete with labor pains. And so think of this, this is a powerful metaphor. And what he's describing is, I've already gone through labor for you. All the pain of labor and delivery I went through, and to, to produce what? A true convert. And yet, what's happened in the meantime? Foolish Galatians wanting to slide back. If we're sticking with a marriage, or with a maternal metaphor, you're trying to go back into the womb. I mean, you remember when Nicodemus was asking Jesus, like, whoa, whoa, whoa born again? Uh, Mom's not going to like that. How can you ever re-enter the womb? Well, it looks like the Galatians figured out how. And it's not just a matter of becoming children again. I want to go back into embryo. I want to go, it, it was, at least it was easy in the womb. That umbilical cord, I sometimes felt restrictive. It wrapped around me, but man, it kept the food flowing. I didn't have to do a thing to provide for myself. And was it easier in that old Mosaic law to check the boxes and say I was done? Is that really where you want to go? Back into the womb? There's buyer's remorse for birth itself. And then when he says next, do, do I really have to travail in birth all over again until Christ be formed in you? Again, his wordplay is fascinating. Because when you're in the womb, the, the mother is forming you. Well, now he's asking them, you be the mother. What's forming in you? Is it a Christian consciousness? Is it a sense of who you're supposed to grow up to become? Is it the Spirit whispering that Abba is the right thing to call God above? I can't imagine. Having seen my wife go through labor and delivery five times for our children, I can't imagine how frustrated she would be if one of the kids <laughs> said, uh, can, I make you, can I put you through all of that all over again? Huh? Oh no, we, we already did that. And yet to try to 
recreate a conversion in someone that was already converted once, that's hard work. Why do you think most missionaries spend the bulk of their time seeking new converts instead of reactivating old ones? Part of it feels easier. Part of it feels like they are, those others already had their chance. Oh, it is equally essential to reactivate the inactive as it is to convert the unconverted. But in some ways, isn't that what we're doing both times? Converting the unconverted? We have to help them form Christ within. Even if it means going through another pregnancy. It's worth it. If they can be born again. And stay out of the womb this time. Keep growing up in God. In verse 21, tell me. Ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? In other words, you really want to go crawl back into the womb? Forget it. Think about what you're, what you're asking for. If you want to go back to the law, do you really want to hear what the law says? Don't you remember? Because all it ever says to you is, you're not good enough. You're falling short. You're not going to make it. I mean, that's the schoolmaster, the disciplinarian, wrapping our knuckles. Do you really want to go back to school that way? Uh-uh. And then he goes back to this Abrahamic analogy he used in the first half of Galatians. But he's going to develop it at greater length here. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. So we always think of Abraham and Isaac, but there was Abraham and Ishmael first, right? Two sons. The one by a bondmaid, and that was Hagar, so the son was Ishmael, and another by a free woman, and that's Sarah, and so Isaac. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Now, of course, obviously, in a literal sense, they were both born by the flesh. Okay? A, a literal son of Abraham either way. But in terms of the covenant, you remember when we studied this in Genesis last year? And it was Sarah at first feeling like, I must be the weak link in the chain. I can't have children. And since the covenant depends on posterity, I must be getting in God's way and my husband's way. And so in her own incredible act of selflessness, she thought outside the box, understood some of the cultural possibilities of her day, and suggested plural marriage. Suggested that Abraham go in unto Hagar, her hand, Sarah's handmaid, and whatever son they had would count for something. It, he could count for the covenant. Well, what's amazing about that is God honored that, blessed Hagar through that, blessed Ishmael through that, brought on an, an entire nation of the Arabs, and that's where the Muslim world emerges from. But God hadn't forgotten Sarah and let her know, yes, that, yes Ishmael will receive blessings and promises, but not the Abrahamic covenant. In some ways, and I've said this before, it's the covenant of Sarah, maybe even more than the covenant of Abraham. Because if it was only Abraham that mattered, then Ishmael's good enough. But no, it's the matriarchs and not just the patriarchs that count. So this has to be a child of promise that comes through the wife of promise. This has to be Sarah's son. And so only Isaac will do. So there's both children of flesh, but the real child of promise, this child of spirit, is, is, is Isaac. Keep going. Verse 24, which things are an allegory? So I'm using this as my metaphor. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, or Hagar as we would pronounce it. For this is Agar of Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But what about this other sign? Ooh, let's talk about that. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So forget the earthly Jerusalem. Let's talk about the heavenly Jerusalem. Forget the flesh son of Abraham. Let's talk about the promised son of Abraham. Forget bondage. Let's go with freedom. Forget Hagar. Let's go with Sarah. Okay, let's, let's cut to the chase. Forget the law. Let's talk about the covenant. Verse 27 and 28. For it is written, and now he's going to quote Isaiah 54, verse 1. 
Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Now, I've always loved that verse in Isaiah 54, because it reminds me of my own wife, who early on in our marriage, as we struggled with infertility, feared that she would be this woman that travailest not, that she would be the, de the desolate with no children. And yet, just like the promise made here, oh, rejoice, you'll end up with more children than the person you were envying before. This is the gathering of Israel. Don't worry that it's been scattered. It, everyone's coming home. And in our own experience, to go from a wife who was lamenting, I'm never going to have children, to a wife, not too many years later, that was lamenting, we're running out of space in our home and we can't fit all of the children. And that was music to my ears. Because that was Isaiah 54, fulfilled in our own lives. Well, here it's being fulfilled in Paul's, and the way he's describing it, it's to take it back to Sarah. This idea of, as Isaac was, thus are the children of the promise. Don't, don't, don't go down the route where you feel like it has to be through Hagar, and it has to be through Ishmael, and it has to be through Sinai, and it has to be through the law. In some ways, and I don't want to, I, don't, I hope this doesn't come across as a scold against Sarah at all. Sarah was thinking outside the box. Sarah was trying to make sure that God could keep her pro his promise. But in some ways, in some ways, was it a lack of faith on her part? And again, I don't want that to come across as negative. We all struggle with lack of faith at times. We all struggle sometimes with... God's made me the promise, but I doubt it can happen that way. So I'm going to give him some other options. I'm going to give him some, some escape routes uh, and say, oh, this is probably how you're going to fulfill that promise. And for Sarah, it was, no, no, no. Don't trust in the arm of flesh, even if it's Hagar's flesh or Ishmael's flesh. Trust in my promise to you. It's going to come through. You may feel barren someday you won't have room for your posterity. And then to finish with this analogy, verse 29 through 31, but as then he that was born after the flesh, that's Ishmael, as he persecuted him that was born after the spirit, and that's Isaac. And you remember in Genesis, there was some friction between the two, which one of us really is the child of promise. There was friction between Sarah and Hagar, which one is the, the blessed wife. Well, even so it is now, Paul is saying. We're still at conflict. There is still friction between Jewish factions and Gentile factions. How? Oh, nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Let's go back to that. And he pulls out an interesting verse from the Old Testament. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, again, that does sound harsh when you put people behind that and realize what Hagar went through and what Ishmael went through when they were cast out at Sarah's request. That was hard for even Abraham. And yet, as we discussed it last year, God did provide. He provided miraculously. And Hagar came to know God in powerful ways through the experience. So, Again, neither bond nor free, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female. We're all in Christ. And hold on to that. But just to use the analogy, we're no longer personifying it. We're no longer talking people here. But as far as principles, we've been made free. We've been adopted into the covenant. We don't have to keep beating ourselves up with the law of Moses. Okay? Cast out those concerns. Cast out that sense of bondage. You are free. And then Paul shifts in chapter 5. Teaching similar principles, but with a little bit of different language. In verse 1, he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Why do you think we cast the bondwoman out? Why do you think we broke that yoke? 
so that Christ could give us his yoke, which is easy, and his burden, which is light. Don't be entangled. If you're a fish that swam out of the net, don't swim back into it. If you're an ox that finally had the yoke removed, are you really going to go find a new one to get back into? No, Christ has, hath made us free. That's liberty. Stand in it. Be confirmed in it. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And that's pretty stark, too. If you are waffling on this, if you're wondering and thinking, oh, I don't know, maybe I really should go back to the old Mosaic way. You Gentiles, especially, if you're thinking like, no, I really do have to pass through Judaism. Is your faith in Christ really that weak? Is your faith in grace so insufficient that you think you have all these legalistic requirements that you have to fulfill? Oh, just because these overzealous Judaizers are, are telling you to? Oh, beware that magic spell. Don't be bewitched, you foolish Galatians. No, that's admitting your doubt in Jesus. And Christ shall therefore profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. I mean, you think about that. You want to go back to the box checking? Because there are some boxes to check? Great. Circumcision is, a, is an easy, well, painful, but an easy one to check. You can check it off and say, I did that. See, I'm a, I'm a member of the house of Israel. I'm part of the Abrahamic covenant. No, no, no. Careful. Careful. Yes, you got back a box to check, but it also brought back all the other boxes. All the ones that remain unchecked because you couldn't live them perfectly. You understand what I'm saying here? You're acting as if Christ hadn't come. And if he hadn't come, then all the unchecked boxes come back to haunt you. Those former sins return, like we studied in our first half. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Paul says. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. And that must have been spoken ironically or sarcastically too, since no one's ever been justified by the law. Well, Jesus accepted Ye are fallen from grace, he concludes. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. That's what it all boils down to. In fact, there's the relationship between faith and patience. It's a great phrase. Through the Spirit we are waiting for for the hope of righteousness. And it's faith that assures us that it's worth the wait. Righteousness will come. I'll grow up in God. I'll become more like Him. He will transform me. I can't be, keep beating myself up over the law. I just have to wait on Jesus. Because if I go back to the law, I've fallen from grace. And I have no hope. I need to let God's grace work in me through love. And if I can trust in his love, then I should have sufficient faith to be patient. In verse 7, Paul then says, Ye did run well. I watched you blast out of the starting blocks. You were sprinting toward the goal. Then who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Who hath bewitched you? Who hindered you? Who brought you back into bondage and sent you back to grade school? Who's doing this to you? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. It's not Jesus saying this. He called you into the path of grace. He's not going to bait and switch and then hit you upside the head with the broken law that you can't keep. No, this persuasion is not of him. But be careful, because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And, and that is an interesting warning. You're starting to get that concern, that anxiety, that perfectionism is starting to well up again. And that leaven, it's going to spread. The, the Jewish leaven is getting back into your bread of life. And it's, it's becoming bread of death. It's spreading mold because leaven does that too. Now be careful what you allow to come in to persuade you. I'm certainly not trying to persuade you to presume upon His grace. God forbid. But they are trying to persuade you 
to think there's no grace at all. And that's false. So please pluck out these seeds of doubt before they grow into trees of disbelief. In verse 10, I have confidence in you. Well, through the Lord, that is. <laughs> okay, I've got confidence in Christ. But as long as you're connected to him, then I have confidence in you too. You can do this with him. I have confidence that ye will be none otherwise minded. So Paul still believes in them. You're going to get through this. It's all right. You're going to figure it out. You're going to make the right decision. I believe in you. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. So you're going to make it. But man, these troublers, these bewitchers, I'm, I am worried about them. Whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Now, that's confusing if we don't understand what is kind of behind the language. When Paul says, if I yet preach circumcision, the idea, the, the, well, at least most likely what's happening is some people may have been accusing Paul. Well, he's preached circumcision too. And that may or may not be true. Uh, I mean, Timothy was circumcised as he started his mission. Was, was Paul behind that? I mean, Paul comes to synagogues to start every missionary message when he comes into a new town. Is he, is he pro-Jewish himself? I mean, he was pretty zealous toward Judaism himself. I've never seen anybody quite like that guy. So are they, first of all, was Paul really doing that? Or were they accusing him of that? Or were they even kind of trumping up these false charges to try to get, hey, even Paul says you should be circumcised. And he's like, whoa, 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 don't put those words in my mouth. I said nothing of the kind. And the way he puts it here is, if I had, why, was, why would I be persecuted right now? I've got all these Jews and Jewish Christians that are, that are fighting me, persecuting me. And we saw a lot of that in Acts chapter 13 and 14. Are they doing that because I'm preaching circumcision? No. Because if I was, they wouldn't have anything against me. I'd be one of them. But I'm not. So that's the first thing to realize. Um, the, I'm preaching the cross of Christ. Okay, That's offensive to them. They would rather that I, were, that I were preaching circumcision. I'm not. But then what he says at the end is brutal. This is some of the strongest language Paul will ever use in any of his letters. It was so... Mm, uh, concerning to the King James translators that they hid it in a euphemism. And in the English, we, we, we don't even bat an eye when we read it. At the end there, when it says, oh, those people that have been pushing you towards circumcision, I wish they were cut off. And that sounds like excommunication. It sounds like separation from the society of the saints. Yep, just cut them off, and that Jewish faction within Christianity should be removed from the church. Okay, that, that's fine. But the Greek, who it's not watered down at all. Because the phrase cut off comes from a Greek word that means amputation or mutilation. And the idea there, in the context of circumcision, think about what Paul is threatening. Not literally, and he's not going to do anything here, but rhetorically, this is as strong a warning as he could muster. Let's compare circumcision to castration, shall we? And since they want to circumcise you, well, they ought to be castrated themselves. Wow. I mean, this is, this is a strongly worded letter. Remember, no praise at the beginning? And some call that foolish Galatians, and who's bewitched you, and I thought better of you, and I doubt you, and what's going on? These are people that needed some strong language, and Paul provided it in spades. Whew, okay. Now, okay, I'm calm. Breathe, breathe, Paul. Count to ten. Okay, we, we good? We love these people, right? And he's like, yes, I do. But that's what gets me so mm, up in arms. Like, they know better than this. I, they, they were so converted. They would do anything for me. They'd pluck out their eyes, but now they're the ones that are blind. Why won't they see? Verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. 
Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And so, yeah, the Jews might have a point here. Please do not presume upon Christ's grace, or you'd be admitting that you needed the law of Moses. So please don't go there. Don't prove me wrong in my hopes for you. But you've been called into liberty. And how should that liberty be made manifest? How about this? Instead of using it as an occasion for the flesh, how about by love serve one another? Wouldn't that be amazing? And you're serving because you want to, not because you're being commanded to. You're serving because it's written on your heart, not checked in a box. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which Paul will preach elsewhere as well. It all boils down to that. Jesus had said that. These are the two great commandments, and upon them hang all the law and the prophets. My law is love, love of God and love of neighbor. But if ye bite and devour one another, Paul says, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. I mean, how's that for <laughs> serious disagreement over the law? You're biting each other. You're devouring each other. Oh, care- you're going to eat each other up if you're not careful. So I'm feeling a little calmer. Sorry for what I said. Uh, can we just be at peace, please? Can we seek what's best for one another? Can we love our neighbor the way the Lord wants us to? Now, to get there, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Which is a beautiful description. How do we overcome the flesh? Well, change gears. <laughs> Shift attention. Don't walk that way. Walk this way instead. It's not about resisting temptation. It's about replacing temptation with something far better. If I walk in the Spirit, then yeah, I don't have time. I don't have interest. I'm not being drawn toward the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the thing that you would. I mean, no man can serve two masters, right? But you will end up serving one of them. These two are so at odds that by choosing one, you have not chosen the other. You've rejected the other. So please choose the spirit. Then there's no worry about the flesh. He says, but if ye are led by the Spirit, if that's what you've chosen, ye are not under the law. So think about this tug of war between spirit and flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, all of that. Lean in the Spirit's direction, and the flesh won't have a thing to say to you. Follow the gospel. Let the law, leave it, be, leave it alone, leave it behind you. He says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. In other words, they're obvious. Which are these? And here comes another one of those lists of sins that Paul is so famous for. You're used to most of them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, which means discord or quarreling, emulations, which means jealousy. This is coveting in the wrong way instead of coveting good gifts in the right way. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. I mean, I could go on, right? Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You just got to let those go. He is warning believers against presuming upon Christ's grace. He's warning them against specific sins. These are the things that the flesh will I'll throw back into your face. You've got to be changed by Christ, or the flesh will always be with you. And even a legalistic approach to obedience? No, nope, can't do that. I'm just going to clench my fists and try hard. Oh, that's not going to work. The flesh will always be drawn toward that. That's why you have to crucify the flesh, symbolically speaking. That's why you have to be buried, the old man. You have to bury the old man and be risen, raised again in newness of life. That's what baptism was for. As as we've seen elsewhere, it's the circumcision. If you want to do circumcision, fine, but make sure it's the heart that is circumcised. 
That's a more difficult operation. It's one only Jesus can perform. So beware all of those things. And if those are things that you need to avoid, what are the things we need to pursue? Right? If I'm avoiding one, I'm, it's because I'm getting the other. I'm walking in the Spirit. That's what keeps me from fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So you've warned me, warned me about all these lusts of the flesh. How do I walk in the Spirit? What does that look like? And again, he has a list. Thankfully, this is a positive one. I love this list. Galatians 5, to 23. I shared this all the time with people in the mission field. If they were wondering, how do I know if the Spirit's with me? Well, here's, here's the best list I know. But the fruit of the Spirit... And that's how you'll know the Spirit's there, because its fruits are present. How can you tell what kind of tree that is? Most of the time, I can't tell until the fruit forms. And now I know it's an apple tree, because I know what an apple looks like. I just don't know what an apple tree looks like. Oh, that's a peach tree. Why? Because I see it's peaches, okay? It's the, by their fruits ye shall know them. And so by the fruit of the Spirit, you'll know the Spirit is with you. And here's Paul's list. It's love. It's joy, it's peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, that's self-control. Against such there is no law, which is a powerful way to describe what we're looking for. Now, he mentions law at the end, which is interesting, because he's been talking about law all the time, right? And so by, I'm not saying that the law was wrong every step of the way. No, the law was, was warning you against evil and hoping to move you in the direction of good. Uh, doing good is not against the law. <laughs> doing good is fulfilling the law. But hopefully you're not fulfilling it just because the law is threatening you if you don't. You understand? No, we want to do this for, more, for purer motives. We simply want to partake of that fruit because it is... Sweet above all that is sweet, and pure above all that is pure. This is the fruit of the tree of life. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and nothing tastes better than this. Can you imagine? Love and joy and peace and goodness. Come unto Christ and partake of this fruit. And if you're feeling this, there's a reason for it. I want to say one other thing, though. Before we, before we leave this verse behind. And this is something that just struck me oh, about a year ago. I'd been asked to speak to the chaplains of the church, whether that was military chaplains or hospital chaplains, uh, prison. I mean, so many places where a chaplain's unique skill set is needed. Chaplains are, are velvet and steel. They have the steel of being able to handle going into the hardest situations in life, but they have the velvet to be soft-hearted when they get there, to help people get through those difficult things. Chaplaincy is typically rooted deeply in religion, but the hard thing about being a chaplain in a secular age is they don't care much for the reasons you're doing things. Right? It's, there's a, skept, a secular skepticism towards anything that is religiously motivated. And so as I was addressing the chaplains, I was worried about that. How do you do your job when, when the world doesn't value the reasons you do it? And that's when it hit me. Well, they might not value the reasons you do it, especially if they're religiously informed, but they'll be grateful for what you're doing, right? I mean, so much of what we do as motivated by the pure love of Christ, that charity that never faileth, well, a lot of it other people can do for lesser reasons. Uh, I mean, there's other people that are, that are providing services, and it's not because of religion in the background. And nobody complains about that, not even the secularists. And so as I was wrestling with this, this verse of Scripture came to mind. Because I hope that we never get to, the, get to the point where religious motivations and religious worship and religious acts are outlawed. I'm grateful for the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and the free exercise of religion. But we are seeing an age that sometimes seems to be pushing back against religious freedoms. I know Elder, President Oaks has raised the alarm on that repeatedly. 
So as I was pondering that with the chaplains, this verse and its ending finally... I've always loved this passage, but the ending's always been a little weird. Against which there is no law. It was like, well, duh, who's going to outlaw love and joy and peace? But that's when it hit me. Can you imagine a day where the secular world is sufficiently strong to outlaw certain forms of religious worship or practice? Again, I hope we don't get there, but if, even if they outlawed religion, would they outlaw love and joy and peace? You see, the irony is, even if they want to burn down the tree, nobody's complaining about the fruit. You, you get where I'm going with this? This is what struck me. There is a vertical and a horizontal component of our discipleship, right? We talked about this with the cross. And vertical is connecting to God. First great commandment, love him. Second great commandment is the cross beam, the horizontal, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, of those two, which does the world seem to have a problem with? They don't want us to love God. They don't even believe in him. But they're totally fine with us loving neighbor, right? So in some ways, keep doing that. Especially when it's motivated by your love of God. Because then you love them in the right way. But you don't have to force your love of God upon skeptics or secularists. They will forever be grateful for your love of your fellow man. Another way to put that is they might oppose the why, namely your religious motivations, but they'll never oppose the what, namely your service to other people, your Christ-like actions. They might not accept that they are grounded in Christ, but the Christ-like action, oh, they'll be forever grateful for it. I remember as I was pondering this, this phrase came to my mind. A river's reach is not confined to its source. Think about that. The source of this river of living water is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his grace that produces in me love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance and everything else. It's Jesus in me. You might not like Jesus. That's okay. You'll love what Jesus produces in me. And so if you don't feel like tracing the river up to its source, fine. You're welcome to the water. One other thought that crossed my mind as I was wrestling with that. Another analogy. If you can get people to where they need to go, they won't care where you filled up with gas. You get it? You helped me. You got me to my destination. You blessed me with love and joy and peace. Where, where'd you get the desire to do that? Oh, this is where I get my gas. It's a Christian gas station. No, 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 stop, stop, stop. I don't want to hear about it. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to. You're the one that asked. <laughs> Who cares where I got the gas? To me, it matters infinitely. There's no gas like it on earth. That's the fuel of faith. And yet, if you just wanted to get to your destination, I was happy to provide the ride. You with me? Well, then this chapter ends. Verse 24 through 26. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We've seen that repeatedly. So, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So yeah, if you're living in it, or so you say, how about walking in it too? Instead of just talking the talk, let's walk the walk. Let's really live this way in a visible, tangible way. Let's treat each other differently. Let's let our second great commandment obedience flow out of the first. Okay? Let's, let's be real Christians, shall we? And then this, and then one more chapter. Chapter 6, since we're talking about living the gospel, let's really live it, shall we? Unlike most other letters that end with, say hi to so-and-so and share my love with so-and-so, and, -so, and I, I, I really wish I could be with so-and-so again. We saw that to Rome, we saw that to Corinth, not to Galatia. Again, there wasn't the commendation at the beginning, and there's not all the, the individualized love expressed at the end. 
Now this, the whole group needs some, <laughs> some shaping up. But let's get there. And so he ends this letter in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and I've been doing that to you, sorry, not sorry. If I call you out, if I recognize where you're falling short, if you do that, ye which are spiritual, please restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. I mean, after all, you're human too. Remember to the Corinthians, oh, if you think you're standing, be, beware lest you fall. We're all human. We all struggle, myself included, Paul would say. So if you see someone struggling, recognize the potential to struggle yourself and be meek as you're crying repentance. Remember, if it's charity, it rejoiceth not in iniquity. No, it rejoiceth in the truth and it bears all things, even other people's mistakes. So if you see somebody doing something wrong, be, be Christ-like about it, okay? Be meek and restore them. And then verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Again, that is the law, right? It's the law of love. And that's the law. I mean, if you want to keep law, you legalists, how about this one? Love each other <laughs> as God loves you. If you want to keep one, that's... You know, that's a box you can spend the rest of your life checking. And hopefully before long, it's no longer a box. It's, it's who you are. He says in verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, <laughs> he deceiveth himself. But it let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. What he's saying there is, go ahead and compare your work, but compare it to your own potential, not to anyone else's. You can rejoice in yourself alone. You don't have to rejoice because, aha, my work's better than yours. No, prove it, but prove it to yourself, okay? He says, for every man shall bear his own burden. And there's personal accountability. There's, I've got a responsibility and I've got to do the very best I can. Uh, Paul, that's how Paul serves everywhere he goes. He senses that burden and he bears it himself. Not building on other people's foundations, not <laughs> watering where he's been called to plant somewhere else. No, Paul's giving it all he's got. But I do love the humility that he suggests there. That if you think you're something, well, first of all, you're wrong because none of us are anything. Christ is everything. And so if, if we nothings think we're somethings, How's that for self-deception? I actually remember as a rookie teacher. And part of it was just so, being so excited to finally teach the gospel professionally. And, and I loved my students. And I wasn't that much older than they were. Just a couple years. And I related to them. And I was full of energy and zeal. And I, I, I love those days. Uh, I, I've slowed down a little bit. I, I still have a lot of zeal. But I'm not quite as what I was when I was 24. And, and I connected with those kids, and I loved them, and they knew it. And they ended up loving me as well. But I remember once, and probably happened more than once, any time that pride starts creeping in, because pride ruins everything, and it's the universal sin. So even pride in good things. And pride because I'm making a difference in teenagers' lives and they're falling in love with the gospel and they're excited about scripture study and man, I must be a pretty good teacher. Oh, whoa, 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 careful, careful. If you're doing it to be seen of man, then it's priestcraft. If you're setting yourself up as a light, if your motives are impure, you've got some cleaning up to do. And I remember, thankfully, very early on in my career, I must have been teaching New Testament and loving it, and the students were loving it too, and then I got to Galatians chapter 6, and I read verse 3, hey, Jared, if you think you're something, <laughs> oh, please remember, you're nothing, so don't deceive yourself. I was so jolted by that verse that I typed it up and printed it out and stuck it on my wall next to my door, on the inside of my office, 
so that the last thing I'd see as I walked out of the office to go into my classroom was a reminder. Don't deceive yourself, Brother Halverson. Uh, your students might say nice things about you. Do not inhale, right? Compared to the Lord who's doing the real teaching in there, you are nothing. So please do not deceive yourself. That's a powerful phrase that might protect us from pride. Paul then says in verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto, or share with is another way to say it. Let them share with him that teacheth in all good things. And I love that kind of teacher-student relationship. They're rejoicing together. They're both being edified. I share with you, you share with me. We're in this thing together after all. Be not deceived, he says. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life eternal. And that's just the law of the harvest that we've seen repeatedly. The question Paul seems to be asking is what kinds of seeds are you planting? Spiritual soil or flesh? What kind of tree are you trying to grow? What kind of fruit will it produce? What are you feeding your students? And what will they end up sharing with you in return? In verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand? <laughs> Which is an interesting ending in that verse. What a, long, what a large letter. And when I first read that, I was like, it's only six chapters. What are you talking about? Well, if it was one of his earlier ones, then, yeah, maybe this felt long to him. And then he built up some stamina and ended up writing really long ones to the Corinthians and the Romans. Well, maybe. Then again, the Greek might not be referring to a large letter, as in the length of his epistle, but rather large letters as in the size of the letter that's on the page. Some scholars have suggested that perhaps a scribe was writing everything up to this point, and then here, Paul takes the pen and is like, oh, I want to write this one with my own hand. And if he does have any kind of eye problems, <laughs> he might need to write really big so he sees it. It reminds me of John Hancock with the, the, the large signature on the Declaration of Independence, which according to legend at least, he did so that King George wouldn't have to pull out his spectacles to see who was talking smack to him. <laughs> okay? Well, maybe it's an eyesight problem. Then again, maybe it's hoping to catch the eyes of his audience. And you bewitched Galatians. If I write big enough... If I speak loud enough, if, I, if my rhetoric is strong enough, if my words are convincing enough, will you change and come unto Christ? Will you trust in His grace instead of thinking that you are still in bondage to the law? I mean, in the immediate context, what is he writing in big, bold letters? This is a picture like all caps across the, the bottom of this epistle. What does it all boil down to, brothers and sisters? It's love each other. It's serve each other. And not because some law is forcing you to, but because the love of God leaves you no other option. You are possessed of charity, the pure love of Christ. If that's the case, then you will not be weary in well-doing. You'll serve until you've got nothing left to give. According to your opportunity, the way he puts it here. And sometimes that's what we lack. And I would serve more if I could. I just can't. I don't have the time or the strength or the ability. I, but I would give more if I could. And that, that is accounted unto you for righteousness. Just ask Abraham. So whatever opportunity exists, then please do good to all men especially those in the household of faith. If we can't figure it out among our own, then we're in no place to be able to bless the rest of the world. We've got an inner vessel to clean. But here it is, bold letters, big capitals, 
please do good. Please be good. It's what the world needs. So verse 12, as we approach the end of this large epistle, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Yeah, I, I'm going to bring this up one last time. I mean, I'm, I'm parting. I, I just gave you some beautiful words, but I don't want you to lose sight of the immediate problem here. So if they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Is that the real reason they're doing it? It's really interesting what he's hinting at here. Perhaps the only reason they're pushing circumcision on you is because, unlike me, they don't want to suffer for the cross of Christ. They want to get along with the neighbors, and they don't want to ruffle feathers. And so instead of preaching the cross of Christ and the grace that flows therefrom, no, to get along with, with a Jewish audience, I'm going to go ahead and preach circumcision and, and require that you be circumcised. Well, easy for me to say. It gets me out of trouble with, with the enemies here. Is that why they're doing it? Because, as Paul says, neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Ooh, and how's that for hypocrisy? They are circumcised, but they don't keep the law. Well, wait a minute. I thought circumcision was the, the sign that I am accepting the law and keeping the law. Well, they're only keeping one part of it. They checked that box. In fact, their mom and dad checked it for them when they were eight days old. They're not keeping the law. They fulfilled one of its outward elements, but it's not changing their inward lives. So their way's not even working for them. It's certainly not going to work for you. So just forget about it. Leave that behind. But, verse 14, God forbid that I should glory. I'm not trying to boast over them. I'm not trying to claim that I'm, that I'm something when I'm nothing. But I am trying to point out how, just how nothing they are. Don't follow their path. They're, they're in it for themselves, not for your benefit. Me, on the other hand, I am in it for your benefit. I, I'm doing this for your sake. I'm doing it for God's sake. So I'm not trying to glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'll glory in. This is like Ammon glorying in the Lord. This is Paul glorying in Jesus as he did in 2 Corinthians. He's glorying in the cross, even though he's being persecuted for it. But he says he's glorying in the cross of Jesus, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, none of that matters, but a new creature. That's what does matter. I mean, Paul is so converted. He's unashamed. He's unafraid. He, he says it like he sees it. And go ahead. Crucify me. You can't, you can't do anything worse to me than what I've already been willing to undergo. Because I've already been crucified. How's that? They can picture his opposers like, what are you talking about? You're still here. It's like, yeah. But I was crucified in Christ. I crucified the natural man. And I now live in Christ. And that's a life you can't take from me. So if you want to take, oh, my mere mortality, no big deal. I'm willing to suffer all things through Christ, who saves me from all things. I mean, honestly, if, if all you've got to go against me is the world, I mean, yeah, I guess that sounds like quite the opposition. But no, if it's the world, oh, I know what the world means. I know that it's nothing I know that Christ overcame the world, so crucify me? Whatever. I already crucified you. I crucified the world, and it has nothing to offer. And so Paul ends, verse 16 through 18, as many as walk according to this rule. So just do it this way. Crucify the world, forget the law, cast out the bondwoman, just overcome the spell you're under. If you'll walk according to this rule, then peace be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Now, yes, I read that right. We're used to hearing the God of Israel. But I love this. is the only place Paul ever says it. The only place it's ever found in Scripture. The God of Israel is one thing. But he's set. He is, he's fixed. What about us? Are we the Israel of God? 
Are we who he wants us to be? That's, that's what we're trying to grow up into. Well, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And so the letter ends. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Remember to the Corinthians when he gave us his litany of suffering. Five times I suffered 40 stripes, save one. Stoned several times. Beaten, mocked. But every scar bears witness of my testimony of him who bore all scars for all of us. And so I don't see those as signs of affliction. I see them as badges of honor. Something that I share with Jesus. The courage of Paul really is amazing. To, to desire more than anything else to help people come unto Christ and stay with Christ. Because Galatians is such a powerful letter to anyone who seems to be drifting away. How oh, the world does have its way of bewitching us. Somehow still trying to accuse Christ of being insufficient in his grace. And so we got to trust in other things. we got to trust in the arm of flesh. We have to trust in our own perfect obedience. We don't. We can trust in the grace of Jesus. It is sufficient for all of us. And so by way of review, I was amazed in such a short letter how many amazing one-liners there were. So without any commentary, just let the Spirit bring to your remembrance the lessons behind these lines. Deliver us from this present evil world. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you. If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. They perceived the grace that was given unto me. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Thou art not more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? Be as I am, for I am as ye are. It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. We, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Ye have been called unto liberty. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. 
Against such there is no law. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Let us not be weary in well-doing. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm blown away by the epistle to the Galatians. I sometimes forget about its power. And then I reread it, and again I'm amazed at all that Paul has taught in these six short chapters. Whichever one of those final phrases, or maybe one that I, I, that I missed, whichever one the Spirit brought to your attention, whichever one he turned into bold letters and all capitals, I pray that we will live, that we will have the humility to accept the Lord's call to be better than we've been, not in some kind of over-anxious zealousness, but rather in meek submission to the Savior Jesus Christ. It's going to be a long time in coming, (laughs) becoming like him. No wonder Paul says that we must not be weary in well-doing. I'm just grateful for, for God's endurance, his faith in us, his hope in our future. And I testify of it. I testify he can be trusted I testify that the Spirit of God has the power to break any worldly spell. So to any out there who are bewitched by a wicked world, or any of you who are losing sleep over foolish Galatians (laughs) that are sliding backward when you just want them to surge forward, that day will come. I'm grateful for the Lord's patience in the process as he strives to get us to trust in his saving grace to the point that we might know without any doubt that that grace is indeed sufficient.